Hey guys, Miles here. Now I may be a bit late to the party on this subject, but you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and say that I'm fashionably late and with good reason. For at least a year, I've followed the stories of various creators on TikTok who claim that they live with a debilitating mental illness. I've gawked at their explanations, been worried by their claims, and have become unsettled by how widespread the whole movement has become. It's not just like a handful of kids gathered in the closet, whispering amongst themselves and telling tall tales. Oh no. <laughs> Guys, it is so much more than that. But this video isn't necessarily about exposing them personally or sharing all the gory details of their supposed stories. People have really already done that. And since I am fashionably late to the whole debate here, I'm gonna take a less discussed angle. In today's video, I'm going to present information that'll debunk three major arguments made by those who believe that they're mentally ill. So guys, grab a cup of tea or get yourself some popcorn and hold on to your seats because here we go. Before we dive into this project, here's some preliminary information in case you haven't already gotten your fill of the whole TikTok mental illness drama train. Simply put, an emerging community of young people have been rising from the sewers of TikTok, making outrageous claims regarding their mental health. Now guys, that may sound a bit harsh, but when you consider the age demographic of said individuals and the sweeping allegations that they're making, it can be overwhelmingly cringeworthy, especially when what they say and what they do are so starkly different. And yes, in case you're wondering, that is a problem. Recently, people have been coming forward claiming that they have serious mental illnesses, such as disassociative identity disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, or even debilitating neurological disorders like Tourette's. And while these are three of the most prevalent, there are many, many others. Nothing is sacred. People have popped up claiming that they have life-altering depression, crippling anxiety, uncontrollable ADHD, OCD, and even autism. Guys, the rabbit hole is deep, dark, and way beyond concerning. But again, that is not what I'm going to be talking about today. That's just a bit of background. Today, I'm going to be talking about three major arguments made by the groups mentioned above, and how you can dispute those arguments and debunk them in a few easy steps. Now guys, short disclaimer, I'm not making this project intending to hurt people, harass them, or even fake claim them. That is not my intention at all. All I'm doing is providing information that will encourage people to think twice before they make a serious claim about their mental health. My hope is to provide those who are questioning these people with valuable and thoughtful information so that they can take such claims with a grain of salt. As someone who personally struggles with a severe mental illness myself, I can see both sides of the argument and even provide critical information from a sustainable viewpoint. That being said, please don't harass anyone who you suspect may be faking a mental illness send them hate, or try to challenge them in any way. This video is meant to be informational and informative. It's not meant to start a revolution of people willing to witch hunt these TikTokers or openly tear apart their stories. I personally believe that knowledge is power, so that's what we'll be focusing on. That way you can debunk these claims on your own time and avoid being sucked into the emotional drama that they can create when they're baselessly supported. With that out of the way, guys, let's begin. Argument number one. I can't afford a diagnosis, or I know me best, so I can diagnose myself. This response is probably the number one argument made by people who feel like they're under fire for not having an official diagnosis. But it's broken into two parts, so let's discuss both. When people tell you that they can't afford a diagnosis, they're really carefully avoiding assigning responsibility to anybody outside of themselves. But that aside, considering the fact that most TikTokers making such claims are middle school or high school age, cost shouldn't really be the main factor that they have to consider regarding treatment. Let me be the very first one to slap that argument down. If you're truly living with a debilitating mental illness that affects every part of your life, then the cost of a proper diagnosis is really the least of your worries, especially if you're not even an adult yet. In all truth, it's incredibly hard to avoid being diagnosed if you truly do have a disorder that follows DSM standards, which, hint hint, most do. In fact, that's how diagnoses are formed, the right way. For those who don't know, the DSM is basically the American Psychiatric Association's Handbook, 
which has been created on the basis of years and years of tireless research and compiled knowledge. So here's the really hard truth. If you have a mental illness, at some point, you're gonna have a breakdown or an episode somewhere that's important. Let's go ahead and just say that that's in the middle of a shopping mall. And during said breakdown, it's entirely possible that someone is going to call EMS. But even if they didn't, let's say that you're there with family and you have a breakdown. Someone is going to have to intervene. It doesn't really matter who, but let's go ahead and just look at both possibilities anyway. Let's say that it is EMS. In all truth, if they can't fix things there on site, then you're most likely going to the ER, where you won't be officially released without some sort of an assessment. And normally, that assessment comes with instructions for continued care. But let's say you can't afford to follow up. You can't really get out of that assessment once you're in the ER, and that assessment will begin to lay groundwork for an eventual diagnosis. If you do end up in the ER, doctors will most likely run tests to rule out any other causes, thus either validating you or offering other possibilities as to why you're having the issues that you are. So guys, that is route number one, and it's unavoidable in nature, meaning that you can't just hide your life-altering illness for very long. At some point, you'll be forced to face what that means, and getting a diagnosis, whether you meant to do so directly or you were indirectly forced to do so, is all part of that process. Now let's go ahead and go with option two. So you have a breakdown in the mall and your family has to all but carry you out or hide with you in a bathroom or something equally embarrassing. Most caring parents will begin to see a pattern and if this behavior does continue and you can't stop it, alter it, or mitigate it, then normally they'll seek to figure out the root cause. Even if you have a family that you claim just doesn't care, people with that viewpoint do in fact have a breaking point. If life-altering symptoms appear on the regular, like they should if you're untreated, undiagnosed, and mentally ill, then they'll only be able to turn away or pretend not to notice for so long. Your issues will begin affecting their lives as well, and once that happens, people normally want some answers. Thus, you're going to be diagnosed at some point. Avoiding that with severe mental illness is harder than trying to hide a needle in five strands of hay. And that's just the ugly truth. On the off chance that neither of those situations occur, so long as you're still in school being observed by teachers and other students, there's an increased chance that your mental health issues will come to light at some point. If that happens, you'll most likely be sent to see a school counselor, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know where that will go. They can't necessarily diagnose you themselves, but they can recommend that you see someone which will eventually lead you to a formal diagnosis. Now, even if money is truly an issue for you, at some point that's going to be challenged. You can't get help without a diagnosis, nor can you receive medication, etc. So that really is the first step to acknowledging your mental illness and beginning on the journey to actual recovery. That is, if you are really being affected by a debilitating mental illness and want to be able to function normally and lead a fulfilling life. And I know guys, for a fact that there are sustainable options out there for sufferers who are seeking an actual diagnosis, which makes this argument almost moot. It will happen, money or not. You can't avoid it forever, even if you feel like you've got the superpower to somehow hide all of your life-altering symptoms. Another interesting argument that I've heard TikTokers make is, I know myself best, so I can diagnose myself. Which, guys, makes absolutely no sense. But let's go ahead and consider why. Let's say you believe that you've broken a bone. You're so sure that you cancel all your plans, stay indoors, and start planning on buying plaster for a homemade cast. Now, you've never broken a bone before, so you can't really know. You just have a general idea that that's what's going on. And you're so dead set on that idea that your mind is like a steel trap, and any other explanation in your mind is null and void. You don't need to have broken a bone before to know for sure. You just know. But how do you know that? Well, you know yourself best, but also you believe that you've broken a bone, despite never actually having that claim confirmed by anyone with true experience. You're not just biased, you're so biased that you don't even consider that you could just have internal bruising or a really nasty sprain. Because you've never broken a bone, it could be any of the above. Even if you feel like you know yourself best, the supporting information just isn't there. And this is where things become sticky. When we form preferences, we don't consider options outside of our own. If someone is dead set that they have Dissociative Identity Disorder, then it's going to be incredibly hard to convince them otherwise, 
or even to convince them that they're normal and have no mental illness at all. They make claims, begin to manifest proof even if it's illogical or off-based, and fight for what they feel that they know best. They have a broken bone because they feel like they have pain and that's the only explanation. No need to actually confirm that medically, they just know because they know themselves better than you do. And no further argument is needed in their mind. The problem is, when you're only considering things from a baseless internal standpoint, then you're totally missing out on the larger picture. You don't even give a doctor's visit or x-rays a chance because you've already made up your mind. Guys, this is dangerously simple because of its wild approach to logic. The entire reason we have psychologists and psychiatrists is for them to make an unbiased assessment of us from a standpoint outside our own. If we could all self-diagnose ourselves, then you'd have people running around with all sorts of wild ideas. And guys, in truth, within this community, that's already a scary reality. Most of the time, we see things through our own personal paradigms, which shift the way we perceive what's truly going on. So anyone, and I mean anyone, who argues that they can self-diagnose because they, quote-unquote, know themselves best, is truly just avoiding a route that may prove them to be wrong. They don't even want to open their minds to the possibility that they might not have a broken bone at all. Because that idea suits them, and their mind focuses in on that while denying all other possibilities, like having something as simple as a sprain, or in this analogy, being neurotypical. So instead of even trying, they stick to what they think that they know and shut out any other possibilities. In short, guys, self-diagnosis as a singular method of proving your position is downright ridiculous. Now, let me back up here for a moment. I am not saying that we don't play a pivotal role in the diagnosis process. When you actually sit down with a psychologist, you can openly inform them about what you're dealing with and they can begin to give you a clearer picture of what's actually going on. But that is completely different altogether. You can't just read up on something, decide that it's so, and then use yourself as the sole point of reference when everyone questions your position. You may never have tasted what true mental illness is like, therefore you can't make a decision based on your own shallow understanding. To arrive at that conclusion takes a full, dedicated team with experience and knowledge that surpasses your own. And let me just tell you this, that's not something that the internet can do for you pro bono. Argument number two. I am so sick, my parents just don't believe me. This is another wildly disturbing argument made by people online who claim to live with a serious mental disorder. So let me just debunk that right now. If your parents or other people in your life don't believe that you're mentally ill, then you should be questioning that claim as well. If you have to convince people that you're suffering with a serious mental illness, then you're barking up the wrong tree. But let me paint this in a different light. Let's say that you're Spanish. You were born in Chile, you're part of a huge Spanish family, and you speak Spanish fluently as your very first language. Let's say that you decide to apply for an immigrant visa and move to America. Do you think you'd need to run around America trying to convince people that you're Spanish, or would that fact more or less speak for itself? If you tried to order a meal, you'd most likely have trouble because you don't speak English. Why? Because your first language is Spanish. If you tried to apply for a job, you'd have to, at some point, list your ethnicity. Why? Because that's an indisputable fact about who you are. And going back a few steps, during the visa application process, your origin would have to be made known. There is no way for anyone to look at you and go, yeah, you look completely Caucasian to me. You sound like you come from Texas or something. No way you're from Chile, sorry. That would be ridiculous. Anyone who's anyone could make an assessment of your lifestyle, taking into account your history or first language, and come up with an idea of who you are. And conversely, who you aren't. Now, mental illness isn't always so cut and dry, but it does follow a similar process. I don't care if it's anxiety, depression, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar, DID, PTSD, or OCD. If you are truly mentally ill, there will be evidence. Take me for example. I have what is referred to as schizoaffective disorder, which is a blend of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And let me tell you this, I had no idea that that was my diagnosis until much, much later in life. But the most important thing is that my parents, the people who know me best, were the first to realize that something was wrong. 
They paid attention, watched my symptoms progress, grew worried, and finally had me seen by someone who could further define what it was that was actually going on. Even then though, they didn't make that deduction alone. I had an army of people around me who could echo their concerns. Teachers, friends, extended family members, the list truly did go on and on. Now I'm mentioning this because it's ridiculously important. If your parents, the closest people to you, have to be convinced that you're truly suffering from a mental illness, it may be time to ask yourself what it is that you're actually dealing with. While it may be easier to hide certain mental illnesses, there will always come a point in which your ability to do so is significantly lessened. And during that time, there are bound to be spectators. So, if you find yourself wandering around trying to convince people in your life to believe you, then you're already in a bit of hot water. And that's just the truth. Argument number three. Believe what you see, not what you don't. This final argument is one that seems to be the most prevalent. Content creators are shoving videos right in your faces, going, look, look and be convinced. Here's all the evidence. See how right I am? I'm really sick. See? Look. Here's me being sick. When in reality, it's often the things that don't make it onto the camera that are the most important. As someone who's been officially hospitalized before, it takes doctors days to truly observe you and get a full picture of who you are and what you're really dealing with. And guys, that's 24 hours a day, not just a handful of two minute periods that are uploaded whenever it's convenient. I've even been bounced around for over a week while those in charge pieced together a grander picture of what my struggles really look like. And let me tell you this, none of that happened conveniently in front of a camera while I flaunted the issues I was having. In fact, it would have been very hard, if not impossible, for me to film myself in a psychotic state, having a breakdown or approaching one. Now, my family members did often film me during these times, but they did so for the sole purpose of gathering indisputable evidence to provide when questioned by one of my many care providers. These days, TikTokers are setting up their cameras, dressing up, putting on an act, and then recording until they're satisfied. From people with DID who are seamlessly switching through altars completely unfazed, to confused kids reacting dramatically to traumatic sounds while pretending to be triggering a PTSD episode, to people faking breakdowns to popular music, and even more that I don't even feel comfortable listing. Guys, it's truly sickening, because the more they strive to prove that they're off their rocker, the more that you actually believe them, but in another way. In all truthfulness, it takes a very inventive person to film this and think that people will actually buy into it. And unfortunately, that's easier than it should be these days, guys. But now, given the last three arguments that I've made, hopefully it'll be that much more simple to define who's truly ill and who's simply standing in a line with a special snowflake shirt on wanting to be included in a trend that they think is interesting. If you've made it this far, I'm going to treat you to a bonus round. Here's another trend that's come to my attention during my rounds on TikTok doing research for this project. The all-important claim of, I can diagnose you if you just listen to a song or a sound and react honestly. Now I won't go too far into detail with this one, but I think it more or less speaks for itself. If there were truly a certain sound or song that could diagnose you with ADHD, PTSD, or autism, there would be absolutely no need for professionals at all. In fact, there'd be no need for psychologists or other licensed facilitators altogether. But let's consider this in another way. If someone came up to you and told you that you could listen to a sound of a car accident and walk away with a broken leg, would you really believe them? Mm, probably not, right? Because even if you listen to a wreck, that doesn't physically mean that you've been altered in any way just based on the fact that you heard that sound. And likewise, diagnosing mental illness off of a sound, a song, or speech is just downright ridiculous. Sort of like clinging to a diagnosis that isn't supported, documented, or even observable by people in your life. I think now more than ever, people are looking to make themselves recognizable. They're seeking inclusion, acceptance, and validation. But guys, they are going about it the wrong way. You don't have to fake mental illness to attain such things. 
In fact, if I'm being truthful, most of the time, when you are truly diagnosed, you lose those things altogether. Recognition becomes watered down and you become a statistic. Inclusion evaporates and you become an outsider. Acceptance is something you have to fight for versus something freely given. And validation is a lifelong journey that you will always feel one step short of completing. As someone who was diagnosed with a mental illness that I didn't agree with for many years, I can tell you that from personal experience. I was so lost in my own pitfalls that nothing that the people around me said made any sense to me for an embarrassingly long time. And what did it take for me to actually be convinced? In short, time. Time and evidence. But in case you're curious and you're wondering, here is a bullet-pointed timeline. Firstly, my life began to fall apart. My friends, family, and teachers all began to express concern. I withdrew, I was forced to see my primary, I was put through months of medical tests to determine whether or not something internally could be causing my issues, I continued to deteriorate, I was hospitalized, assessed, and let go because the ER psych ward was full and didn't facilitate long-term stays. In short, nothing was addressed, my life continued to fall apart, I was bounced around from different therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists who all took a shot at explaining what I was dealing with and then gave up or moved me on to someone more qualified. I was taken to see some of the top psychologists in the area, and finally they began to truly understand what may be causing my issues. After years of searching, I was given a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which at that time had progressed from childhood schizophrenia to schizophrenia, given my age at the time when my symptoms had been observable and the time in which I was officially diagnosed. After that, I was put on medication and forced to go through med trial after med trial. I was hospitalized again at a behavioral facility. Then my diagnosis was broadened. I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. I went back to the drawing board and had to try even more medications. Then life continued on, only now I had a label, and nothing could erase that because of the countless years of evidence that were tirelessly collected by people other than myself. I was not on board with the diagnosis process at all, and in all truth, I provided very little personal evidence, and I absolutely never filmed myself for proof or fought for a specific diagnosis. Every single decision was made outside of myself by those around me who had observable and disputable proof to back up their assessments. And if I'm being completely honest and transparent with you guys, often enough that is how actual true diagnoses are made. So in closing, I hope you've learned a bit more about how to debunk some of the most common arguments provided by people who may be using mental illness as some tool to feel accepted, integrated, or unique. You cannot avoid diagnosis with a condition that manifests itself in every part of your life, whether you have the money or not. At some point, believe me, it will happen. Secondly, you can't just skate by undetected when you have a debilitating mental illness that's observable in your everyday life. And lastly, you can't expect premeditated film projects to validate your condition. That's just not how it works. Guys, you're special for who you are. That's a fact, and that's something that doesn't change. Adding mental illness to your bio doesn't necessarily increase your value. You can't just power up by slapping I have PTSD or OCD or autism to the end of your biography. I've seen way too many people have their careers and lives ultimately destroyed by being untruthful about what they're dealing with. Those sorts of experiences do follow you through your life, and believe me, they aren't easily covered up. So my advice is just be truthful because someone somewhere someday will question you. And if they're as experienced as I am, you may just find yourself on the losing end of a very long argument. And nobody really wants that. We have enough arguing over trivial things online every day. Don't add to that. Be you, not a cog in the TikTok view machine. Well guys, I hope that you've enjoyed this project, and while it may not have covered everything I could possibly have discussed, I hope that I was able to hit a few key points that make sense. Alright everyone, thank you so much for watching. This is Miles signing off. I love you all, stay healthy, and stay awesome.